College of Engineering Distinguished Lecture. My name is Jennifer Curtis and I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering here. Today it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. David Zombach from Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Zombach is the Hammerschlag University Professor and Head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Carnegie Mellon. The emphasis of his research and teaching is on water quality engineering, water resource sustainability, and energy environment issues. His current work is focused on climate change adaptation for infrastructure, inner basin water transfer in the U.S., recovery of rare earth metals from brines, and sustainable mining of metals. He received his bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering from Carnegie Mellon University, a bachelor's in mathematics from St. Vincent College, and a PhD in civil engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was also elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2008. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Dezonbeck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, it's a pleasure to be here. I've known a number of faculty here for many years, but it's my first time on campus. And uh, as I've said to a number of them, the strength of University of California at Davis that I've felt for years uh, from afar and from interacting with my colleagues at conferences, I now get to see it in person. It's been a wonderful visit. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Dean Curtis and I started on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University at just about the same time uh, a while ago, and uh, we miss her at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm pleased to reconnect with you too, Dean Curtis. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, some work we've been doing over the past couple of years with PhD student Karen Dixon, of course it's really his work, on a topic that's interested me for quite a long time, and I obtained some flexible funding and I uh, found a way to do it finally and uh, at least get into the topic a bit. And I thought this would be a good topic to bring out here to uh, Davis considering the interests of California and water, uh, the advanced science and engineering around water in California and people here think about it all the time. In the water rich east that's not necessarily the case. So we're going to be talking about interbasin transfers and a link to that in, in an assessment of water risk. and. Uh, We'll end the talk with that. So we have, uh, as a species, been transferring water around for uh, human use for quite a long time, starting well, e well with the Egyptians uh, and then uh, coming up uh, the Romans, the famous Roman aqueducts throughout Europe, in Italy and France and in other parts of the world, uh, moving wa around water underground, through underground conduits in South America, in Iraq, in the Middle East, for millennia, human beings are figuring out ways to move water from one place to another to serve our purposes. And these transfers are occurring today around the world and in the United States. In the United States, for example, the New York City water supply brings its water supply from uh, pretty far away from the city, uh, from the Catskills and from the Croton watershed uh, down to the city and uh, it's a massive infrastructure to do that. Here in California, Los Angeles imports over 95% of its water, bringing it from Northern California to the south, from pumping the Col part of the Colorado River over the mountain and, and uh, bringing snow melt from the Sierra Nevada to the city. And the Central Arizona Project, bringing water from Lake Powell south to Phoenix. So we, we have a number of very large transfers in the United States and a number of smaller transfers. These are among the most prominent. And interest in water transfers continues to the present. Uh, this is a cartoon from just last summer uh, when the West suffering through wildfire season. This was one um, uh, cartoonist for the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, idea about how to address that uh, challenge of fire in the, in the West. But uh, there have been some pretty grandiose schemes proposed for moving water from, uh, from, the, uh, from the Mississippi River West, from the Great Lakes, from Alaska south, uh, and interest in water transfers continues. The last uh, major study of interbasin water transfers in the United States was 1985 and 86 by the U.S. Geological Survey. It was done by 
mailing paper surveys uh, to major water users that were uh, employing transfers. And it was done at the uh, HUC 4 level. We'll define that in a moment. These are hydrologic unit codes used to define basins developed by the U.S. Geological Survey. That was the last inventory of, of interbasin transfers in the U.S. And as we undertook to update that and, uh, and look at the protocols that the USGS used in 1985 and 86, a number of very basic questions uh, need to be uh, addressed. What constitutes an interbasin transfer? And there are, uh, there, there are various engineered systems for moving water, and, and, and so we looked at human-made systems that are moving water. Different, there are different kinds of systems, but, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. And a basin, so we think about a, a basin uh, divine, defined topographically where uh, precipitation falls, snow melts, and water flows uh, to, a, uh, to a stream, a river, a discharge point. But there are basins at different scales, so uh, what kinds of uh, basin definition, what scale of basin does one want to consider in thinking about an interbasin transfer? And we had to make some decisions about that. There are no standard definitions for what constitutes a basin. People think about basins at different scales for different purposes. So this is the USGS hydrologic unit code system. And some of you are very familiar with this, others uh, perhaps not so much, so I thought I'd just walk through this quickly. There are different levels of a basin considered here, a very large region down to a subwatershed. And the entire United States has been mapped out uh, in this manner by the USGS. And there are 21 of these very large basins or regions with a code that is defined by two digits. And then we can subdivide these very large regions into subregions. They have four digits in the code, or it's a HUC4 uh, delineation of basins, or uh, what the USGS called a basin. HUC6, six, six digits in the code. Some examples are given here of particular uh, basins and subbasins. It's further subdivided. Uh, HUC 8, further subdivided, HUC 10, and the finest resolution, HUC 12. And for our work, we worked at the HUC 6 level for what the USGS calls a basin, and there are about 370 of those in the United States, uh, and the average size of those is about 27,000 square kilometers. So the geometry of those, uh, of the uh, the different hucks varies, of course, depending on, on, to, uh, on uh, topographic delineation, but on average they're about that size. So there are different scales here at which we can uh, think about a basin and, and transfers of water across a basin. So this map uh, showing the, the uh, United States, the thick red lines on there are the boundaries for the Huck 2 basin. So there are 21 of those. And uh, the finer red lines on here are the delineations of HUC6 basins, and there are 370 of those. So it gives you an idea for uh, the number and the scale of these units that we considered in, think, in, in inventorying interbasin transfers. So in our work, we had three objectives, and I'll walk through each of those. The first one was to identify interbasin transfers in the U.S., looking at transfers of water across HUC-6 boundaries. The second objective was to study these transfers to learn about the factors that led to their construction. What were the drivers of their development, their original development? The purposes of some of these transfers have changed over the years, but we looked at the purposes for the original development. And, and we collected information about when these uh, transfers were uh, constructed and initiated. And the third objective here was to look at water supply risk in the United States, and we looked at a methodology that's been developed by a group here in California to assess uh, uh, sustainable uh, water, uh, risk to sustainable water supply, and uh, the role of IBTs in mitigating that risk. 
and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. So the first objective here, the uh, updating the inventory and doing it at the HUC6 level. So there are some new uh, data sets and tools available now that were not available in 1985. And in particular, the USGS National Hydrography data set uh, released in 2016, uh, the USGS Watershed Boundary data set released in 2013, and the use of uh, GIS tools that were just in the, their infancy in 1985 and 86. These were the primary uh, sources for the uh, identification of interbasin transfers. And we used the uh, NHD, National Hydrography data set, in the following manner. There are seven types of uh, water uh, flow conveyances identified in the, in the uh, NHD. And we focused on three of those related to uh, human-made uh, transfer uh, convey or conveyances for water. And that uh, includes pipeline conveyances, uh, canals and ditches that are designed for specific purposes, and uh, larger scale, uh, well not necessarily larger scale, but uh, canals and ditches that are developed to connect uh, two natural water bodies. And they are given the name artificial path in the NHD. So uh, looking at transfers across HUC6 boundaries, of those three types, we identified uh, more than 2,100 across the United States, and uh, they are shown here on the map of the lower 48 states. And these are in the National Hydrography data set identified as reaches. So uh, some of these identified transfers are uh, separate reaches on uh, an extended uh, uh, an extended conveyance, such as the Central Arizona project that has several reaches uh, along it. And you get a sense for where these transfers occur. Uh, and uh, we'll show another map uh, uh, looking at the density of these uh, transfers in just a moment. So we identified 2,161 of these, and that is a great deal more than were identified in 1985 and 86. 1985 and 86, they were looking at transfers across HUC4 boundaries, and that's a coarser scale of resolution. And they were limited to paper surveys. So uh, we had some advantages here with di digitization of these, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the HUC uh, basins and uh, tools for analyzing the data that definitely not available in 85 and 86. The top five states where these uh, transfers occur are listed here, uh, California among them. And you see Florida has the most by a good uh, amount relative to the other states. Uh, and a lot of those are relatively short transfers for drainage in, in Florida. We'll talk about reasons why these uh, transfers were constructed in, in a little bit. So here is uh, another uh, look at the plot of the uh, locations of these transfers shown as uh, density. Uh, in terms of uh, the count of the transfers per square kilometer. And uh, you see the clusters there in uh, central and southern Florida, in southeast Texas, especially around Houston, and eastern uh, North Carolina, uh, California, Arizona, and some others scattered around uh, New York, uh, eastern New York. Importantly here, we do not have information about volume of flows in these transfers. Uh, there is no national data set that en enables that analysis. That would, needs, it would need to be done on a transfer by transfer basis and for some of these transfers it would be hard to get information about that. So these, this density reflects occurrence. It doesn't re reflect uh, relative importance in terms of volume transferred. So that, those, that was the inventory aspect. We, that work was published in the Journal of the American uh, Water Resources Association. And uh, the second uh, part of the work uh, is, will be published soon in the same uh, venue. And that is uh, the, the effort to assess the 
drivers for the construction of these transfers and uh, to identify the period of construction. And uh, there, that took uh, a lot of uh, detailed work looking one by one at individual transfers. Uh, there, some of these transfers, uh, interbasin transfers have been studied in, in great detail, these uh, very large and prominent transfers that uh, we talked about at the beginning. But there's uh, been no general analysis for uh, transfer drivers of transfer construction in the U.S. And we also undertook to look at uh, effects of uh, regional location, different climate zones of the U.S. and whether uh, there are relationships there about uh, the occurrence of transfers in, in particular regions. So this is uh, what uh, the work that uh, ICARAM did in this uh, portion of our effort. And uh, we looked at the transfers in nine climate zones of the United States that have been identified by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That was uh, one means of classifying the transfers that we identified. And within that uh, classification, we further uh, subclassified the transfers according to their proximity to the following features. And proximity defined here as within 100 kilometers. Proximity to a city, and we defined a city as having a population more than 200,000 people. Proximity to irrigated agriculture, and we defined that as uh, near agriculture that has greater than 10% of the land under production that is irrigated. IBTs that were located near, near uh, uh, not near either of those features, and then IBTs that were located within proximity, within 100 kilometers of both of those features. So it was a further way of classifying uh, the transfers that we identified. And uh, just to uh, back up here, uh, we had 2,161 of these transfers that we identified, and uh, we've classified them, we could classify them in this way, but to um, uh, study them in more detail, we needed to go one by one. With this classification, uh, by proximity to cities, to irrigated agriculture, or to both, uh, we learned that most IBTs are near irrigated agriculture. And that's not a surprise, but it, there are variations in uh, the location, the proximity to these features, depending on a part of the country and uh, as uh, organized by these climate regions here in the south and southeast. Uh, proximity to agriculture is dominant in the northwest and west north central. IBTs are rural or they're near agriculture in the west near both agriculture and cities. So there are variations in, in the occurrence of transfers in different parts of the different parts of the country. To learn more about these transfers and the, the drivers of their construction, as I said, we needed to go one by one. And uh, it would be a, a very big task to go through all 2,161 of them. And uh, we selected 109 as a subset of that uh, 2,161, or about 5% of the, the, uh, the total number of IBTs. And, uh, investigated each of these, which took a lot of legwork to do. Uh, so most of the information about these transfers is not in the peer-reviewed archival literature. It's a lot of secondary literature, technical reports, government reports, newspaper articles, and a lot of talking to people. Talking to uh, conservation service officers in different counties where the transfers are located. Uh, talking to other uh, state agency people, uh, the state engineer of Nevada, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the various states have uh, water engineers, especially here in the West. So uh, frankly, it was a lot of dog work, and, uh, it, uh, but it, and it developed uh, primary data that uh, haven't heretofore been compiled. And, to choose these 109, uh, there was a, uh, Karim and I put together a, uh, a, some criteria for selecting them. We wanted uh, representation from each of the climate regions, and there were different numbers of these transfers in different climate regions, 
and we tried to select a number, uh, the same proportional number from each climate region. By proximity to potential users, we wanted to get a representation of uh, transfers that were near cities, near agriculture, or uh, not near either of those, or near both. And we wanted some uh, representation from uh, transfers that were located in these uh, hot spots uh, where uh, there was a density of transfers in one location. So 109 were selected and uh, investigated each in detail. And from that effort, there were four major primary drivers that were identified. You, the uh, creation of a transfer for municipal supply or for industrial use, and, and a primary industrial use is uh, withdrawal of uh, water and access to water for cooling of thermoelectric power plants. Uh, the agriculture, a major driver. Drainage and flood management. Uh, I mentioned that was a significant driver in, in Florida and elsewhere in the in eastern North Carolina, other locations. And a number of the, especially the earlier uh, IBTs that were developed in the United States were for commercial shipping and navigation. There were some that uh, were originally developed with both agriculture municipal and municipal supply and industrial use in mind. And so uh, we identified a, a driver here as a combination of those two. And looking across uh, all of the 109 uh, subset and the drivers that were uh, of their original construction, their original development, this is kind of, th this is how the, uh, that analysis uh, uh, ended up. Shown here are these uh, major drivers, um, agriculture, shipping and navigation, drainage and flood management, uh, municipal and industrial, and then a combination of municipal, industrial, and irrigation for agriculture. Uh, Louisiana has three that were developed specifically for hunting and trapping, and that was kind of unique to Louisiana. You can see drainage and flood management is a big uh, a big uh, part of the uh, a big part of the story for the development of uh, many of these transfers. So, uh, looking over the the information was uh, and data were collected for these 109 uh, subset uh, transfers. Uh, the majority of them were constructed over the hundred years between 1880 and 1980. Uh, there haven't been that many in the past several decades. The earliest were for shipping and navigation, and the more recent ones were, were more to serve urban purposes for municipal water supply and, and uh, water for, for uh, power generation in particular. But the development of these transfers is, is hardly dead. Uh, they're still very much discussed. There are projects under development uh, around the country, and, uh, but the, the heyday was in that 100-year period from uh, 1880 and 1980. And if we plot the number of IBTs constructed versus time with the earliest ones being developed in the early 1700s up to the present, you get a sense for when the transfers were constructed and the reasons for which, uh, and the distri distribution with time of the reasons for which they were uh, constructed. So uh, then the, the third objective here, uh, to look at uh, water supply risk and uh, the role of IBTs in mitigating that risk. In this effort, we, uh, were, we, we studied quite a bit and uh, were intrigued by uh, work done by Sue Joy Roy and group at Tetra Tech Research and Development. They're located uh, down on Walnut Creek. I think they've done some work with Davis over the years. And uh, they developed a, uh, for a sponsor, uh, a sustainability risk index, water supply sustainability risk index. That was published in Environmental Science and Technology in 2012. And there, to develop this index, I mean, there are many factors one could consider in constructing a water index. That, so there are decisions to be made 
about factors to include, not include, and, and how to include them. But uh, they made some decisions, and, uh, and here's what uh, they put together. Uh, they had identified five risk factors, and uh, that included local renewable supply. And that is, uh, for their analysis, essentially uh, precipitation uh, within the boundary, and they worked on a county basis. So it, it would be the precipitation would fall within that county. And they considered the summer deficit. So in many areas of the country, like here in California, uh, the rain comes in part of the year, and there's hardly any rain the rest of the year, and especially in the summer. So the difference between supply in the summer and, uh, and demand in the summer uh, constitutes the, the summer deficit. They made projections about growth in water withdrawal from, uh, they were working from a baseline of 2005 to 2050. To do that, uh, they estimated growth in population and associated water demand, growth in electric power production and associated water demand, uh, and uh, looked and, and and how that would be influenced uh, by uh, and, and and comparing those demands against uh, supply. Again, considering uh, precipitation uh, as the sustainable source for a particular location, uh, projecting that in 2050 through use of uh, downscale global climate models. And they used an ensemble of 17 climate models and made projections for every county in the country uh, of what the precipitation uh, would be in 2050 and, uh, and compared that to projected demand then. And so they considered the growth in water withdrawal in 20, uh, in, in, over that period, 2005, 2050, and the increase in the summer deficit uh, over that period, uh, considering uh, what the demand would be and what the supply would be at, in 2050. They also considered groundwater use, and groundwater use as a fraction of total water use. And uh, the idea here is that if you have groundwater as a high, and you need to define what high is as a high fraction of total water use, that you're in danger of imperiling your groundwater supply, and it's a, it's a risk uh, factor. It doesn't take into account uh, some locations uh, might have a, a very thin aquifer upon which to draw with uh, relatively limited water supply. Other locations might have uh, very uh, substantial aquifers uh, that re really requires a site-by-site -site analysis, uh, but this is the they, they looked at this fraction, and for each of these risk factors, they considered binary values. Uh, they assign a zero or assign a one, and would add that up across these five factors. So you know decisions are made here uh, about what to include, what not to include. The scheme for uh, weighting, uh, uniform weighting here, and just a zero one, you know, it's a decision, you can argue with it, but this is the system they put in place. And uh, with that, they, uh, one of the maps they produced uh, was this, uh, showing the water supply sustainability risk index, the sum of those five factors on that binary assignment of values to each of the factors, and uh, identified uh, low to high to extreme risk across the United States uh, using that scheme that they developed. And you can look at this map and think, well, you know, there's a lot of red and dark red in the West. That kind of makes sense. But uh, you look in other areas uh, and you see uh, Florida with a lot of red and dark red there. Or, gee, it rains a lot in Florida. That's kind of surprising. And, uh, and as I was studying this, I noticed uh, this feature along the Mississippi River, red and dark red. Well, gee, there's a lot of water in the lower Mississippi River, you know, what's, what's driving that? And uh, I noticed uh, Allegheny County as a red, uh, meaning high risk. And Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is located, two major rivers come together there to form the Ohio River. 
and essentially we are never without water. I just, uh, something was, uh, you know, uh, didn't quite make sense here. And what, what was missing, a, a, a critical aspect of what they put together was that they did not consider natural importation of water. So in Pittsburgh, we benefit from water flowing down, uh, big drainages for the two rivers that meet there. And uh, that importation of water, we can always rely on that because we're draining very big areas uh, to, to get to where they come together in Pittsburgh. Uh, now it was a decision not to include uh, importation of water, but uh, in the analysis that we did, uh, what we sought to do was build upon what uh, the Roy et al. group had done. And uh, we did a couple things differently, but a, a, a key aspect of the analysis that we did was to consider natural importation of water or natural transfer of water across boundaries. And to do that, uh, we employed uh, a model that uh, didn't exist when uh, Roy et al. were doing their work and that uh, C.J. Roy actually pointed us to. And this is a model developed by the uh, U.S. Forest Service and it's known as the Water Supply Sustainability Index Model or the WASI model. It's a monthly water balance model and it, uh, it considers the entire United States as the Huck Huckate watershed level, so that's a bit finer resolution than what we uh, were analyzing with the Huck 6 watersheds. And uh, it, it, it's a very sophisticated model and it provides monthly and annual flows at the Huckate level for every um, Huckate subbasin in the United States. A little bit of information about this model. So, you know, big models include many subcomponents and uh, many decisions about parameters. Uh, and the kind of uh, aspects of those models, any large model exercise does, it, it becomes a bit black box-ish, but uh, it give you a sense of uh, com the components of the model. They used uh, United States Geological Survey water use data uh, that uh, are for the entire United States, and they converted those to the watershed level, to the Huckate level, which they were working. Population estimates, that were again converted from the county level to the watershed level. They use climate data uh, from the uh, PRISM data collection that spans 1960 to 2015 or, or to the present, something like that. And the model includes various other submodels, uh, empirical models to uh, estimate evapotranspiration, infiltration, soil storage, snow accumulation, melt surface runoff, base flows. Uh, and I'll show a schematic in a moment of, of the model. It's a water balance model for each, uh, each uh, watershed. And they, the model includes three of uh, climate models that were a part of the IPCC collection of models. We'll talk about how those are run in a moment for doing a forward projection of uh, precipitation in different watersheds, downscaled uh, global climate models. And there are three primary modules in this framework. The water balance module, ecosystem productivity, and we really didn't use that uh, module in our work, and the water supply and demand module, we did use that. We used the first and third modules. So the, the, the water balance module uh, computes for each uh, uh, e each of the uh, watersheds that are being evaluated uh, water use, evapotranspiration, and yield, or the runoff uh, from, the, uh, from the watershed. And inputs to that are listed here, temperature, precipitation, leaf area index, that is some measure of land cover, uh, and impervious uh, cover fraction by land cover, if it's an urban area with a lot of impervious cover compared to a, a farm field, soil properties, so there are a lot of uh, data that have been compiled uh, from different uh, sources to go into the WASI water balance model. And uh, what it does is put together these processes uh, to evaluate what the, uh, for a particular uh, Huck 8 watershed, what the inflow will be, what the outflow from the watershed will be, considering what comes down onto it, what evapotranspires from it, what goes into the ground, uh, what moves out from base flow to the, uh, to the drainage from the watershed. And 
that provided us, this provided us a tool to estimate uh, for each of our Huck 6 basins the, uh, the, inflow, the, the inflow and outflow from that basin to estimate the natural importation of water uh, to each of, the, uh, each, of, each of the basins. The water supply and demand module of uh, WASI calculates the total monthly water demand, the groundwater withdrawal and return flows, and uh, it accumulates and roots the water, uh, subtracting consumptive use. So again, that enabled us to uh, make this uh, estimate of uh, importation uh, and exportation from uh, each of our uh, basins. These are the outputs uh, provided by WASI, and we were focused in particular on these two, the annual water supply and demand and the monthly water supply and demand. So uh, this required uh, some, uh, a lot of work by CARAM and, and uh, conversion between the county and watershed level and, uh, and, and using uh, GIS to uh, uh, to, to do that kind of uh, segmentation uh, of uh, both the, the uh, model outputs and data that we were bringing into the model as well. The projection of water withdrawals in 2050, uh, we conducted that uh, in a similar way to uh, that uh, done by Roy et al. We estimated domestic water uh, supply demand based on population increase. We estimated thermoelectric power demand uh, using projections from the Energy Information Administration, part of the Department of Energy, and making some assumptions I'll walk through in a moment about technology, water cooling technology, uh, and how that will evolve. The other sectors for uh, water withdrawals, especially agriculture. Roy et al. did this. They held a constant. Uh, now, that, that probably is going to change too between now and 2050, but uh, perhaps not as drastically as uh, public supply and, and thermoelectric power. That was held constant projecting ahead to 2050. And we considered range of withdrawal values, uh, estimating a low, medium, and high value, and we did that in the following way. We considered uh, three, we call them water risk scenarios, low, medium, and high. And these were a combination of a couple different uh, forcing factors here. The greenhouse gas emissions, we used three scenarios, low, medium, and high scenario, uh, taken from uh, the IPCC collection of scenarios and similar to what Roy et al. did. We considered these scenarios with each of these three models that are included in WASI, and I'll talk about how we did that in a moment. We considered uh, the, th for thermoelectric power water withdrawal in 2050, and thinking about the change from current or 2015 values, uh, we considered a, uh, a high projection that uh, is in line with uh, current water demand for different types of uh, power generation, thermoelectric power generation, that would put you at about a 10% increase. But a lot is happening in that space, driven by regulation and technology development. So here in the West, there's not new fresh water available for power plant cooling. There's a lot of um, investment in technology development, deployment, and dry cooling. And uh, certainly more of that's going to come online by 2050. Uh, and, uh, and actually, uh, even in the water-rich east, there are many places that there's, there's fresh water there, but it's spoken for, and there's no new fresh water available for uh, power, uh, cool, power plant cooling. In the southeast, I was telling some folks at dinner last night, faces tremendous uh, constraints in that regard. So uh, these are uh, created by us, but uh, a medium scenario, a 25% reduction in water demand, and a low scenario, a 50% reduction. And then the three different population estimates, uh, one from the, the Census Bureau projection, the national projection for uh, the US, uh, the high estimate from a, 
an extrapolation of the rate of population growth from 2010 to 2015, extrapolate that out to 2050, that put us at the high end, and then a population model embedded in WASI we took as a medium uh, projection. For each of these low, medium, and high scenarios, we ran uh, the model using each of these three climate models separately. It's the way it's set up in WASI. And so we had nine uh, runs here with, that generated a lot of information for each HUXIX uh, base in, in the United States. And we averaged the results of those to, to get the results that I'll show you. So uh, this is for the medium scenario. And what's shown here is projected change in population 2015 to 2050. Uh, with the darker colors indicating the largest changes in population. This is done county by county across the United States. And uh, you can see uh, the dark areas where population is projected to increase the most for the medium scenario here. Uh, no big surprise there, but uh, no big surprises in here probably for most of you, but uh, uh, water demand uh, is uh, the uh, domestic uh, public water supply demand is estimated from these population numbers. And using the uh, WASI model, we were able to pr uh, project changes in surface water flow. And so changes in surface water flow are a combination of both how supply is going to change, how precipitation may change in a, or is projected to change in a region, and how demand is going to change in that region, resulting in different uh, uh, inflow and outflow for particular uh, basins. Uh, and so we um, looked at the change in annual projected surface water supply. And as I say, that includes what's going to, what we're projecting is going to happen with climate and what we're projecting is going to happen with demand. And here is uh, one of the graphs that we produce from that, again, for the medium scenario. And uh, the, green, the, the light blue to dark blue colors here are the, uh, reflect uh, the largest increases for projected changes in flows. And uh, we converted this to a county by county basis from a HUC6 basis to be consistent with how Roy et al. did their work for purposes of comparison. And uh, you can study that for a bit. Uh, it, uh, there are some parts of that that uh, in intuitively make sense. There are other parts that are, uh, uh, there's a lot going on there. And uh, we'll focus on California here in a moment. But uh, you see there's blue there, a lot of blue for California in terms of projected change in annual surface water flow. Uh, so let me talk about, uh, to, to get to a modified uh, water risk factor uh, following the methodology of Roy et al, but modifying some of the factors. We considered the extent of use of annual county water supply current, 2015. The extent of use of it. So there's a supply and then there's how much we're using. The extent of use of the summer county water supply, current. So again, in many regions of the country, including right here, uh, the situation this summer with respect to uh, availability of uh, uh, runoff from precipitation is a lot different in the summer than the winter. We considered the projected demand change from 20, present 2015 to 2050. We considered the extent of use of the summer county water supply in 2050. So up here we're doing that uh, in current and uh, another risk factor here, what, what is it going to be like in 2050? And we considered the extent of use of groundwater as a fraction of total water use today. So again, you could select different factors. Um, you could organize your own index in different ways. We, we were trying to follow uh, pretty closely what Roy et al. did, but with some modifications. And we weighted the, uh, we, 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 we used a, a similar kind of uh, additive scale, but we didn't uh, use a binary system. We uh, assigned to each risk factor a score from zero to five. And this is an, ordinal scale with, uh, with, with uh, uniform divisions of risk. And if you're at one, it doesn't, and, uh, it comparing one to four, it doesn't mean you have four times more risk if, you're at a, if we assigned a, a, a value of four. But it was a, an attempt to 
provide some, uh, some, some uh, scale to, to each of these factors. And so across the five factors, uh, the maximum you could have if you assigned a five to uh, every one of those risk factors, you'd have a maximum of 25. And, uh, and then we uh, divide it up uh, from low, moderate, high to very high risk uh, in equal increments from zero to 25. And the, uh, so we have these five risk factors down the left column here. They're listed here in words. Uh, and we made these assessments of scale for risk factors. So if we look at proportion of groundwater withdrawal to total withdrawal, uh, a very small fraction, zero to 10%, assigned a risk factor of zero, above 30%, a risk factor of five. And that was based on some study of the literature, what Roy et al. did. So these are, in a sense, arbitrary assignments. You might have your own way of scaling these things, but uh, it, it was an uh, uh, attempt to get a little more gradation for each of these risk factors. And to achieve a very high risk, uh, you would have to be classified with a four or five uh, in, uh, in most of, of the five factors. Uh, so to, uh, if you keep that in mind. And uh, so here's a uh, water risk index map uh, for 2015 with uh, the darker colors indicating higher risk. And again, this is at the county scale. And uh, you see that the uh, very high risk is, uh, shows up in California, Nevada, and New Mexico. And uh, there is uh, pretty low risk at, in, in most other areas according to this scheme uh, that we developed. And notably here, uh, the, with consideration of water importation, uh, along the Mississippi River, it's pretty low risk, and here in Pittsburgh, in Allegheny County, uh, uh, it's pretty low risk as well. If we plot on this same map the location of interbasin transfers, the, the 2,161 of them that we identified, uh, you can see where they fall, and, uh, and so we put some thought into uh, their, their role in uh, uh, relative to this risk and in mitigating this risk, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, as an example, one observation here, so if you look at these interbasin transfers uh, in Colorado, they're located in an area we've flagged as low risk, but there are a number of transfers in there. Those transfers, uh, a number of them are moving water across the Continental Divide to supply Denver. And uh, so that's you know, an example of moving water from a, an area at low water risk to an area at high water risk. And a lot of these areas with high water risk, it's because there are a lot of people there. There are a lot of users of the water, which relates to the demand. So if we take a, a zoom in here on, on California, uh, we notice a couple of things. Northern California is pretty low risk, and from central to southern California, uh, according to this scheme, uh, it's a high risk, high to very high risk. And uh, that uh, those very high risk counties uh, are those that include counties with very large water demand, especially agriculture, of course. And while there is, um, and actually the climate models show uh, Northern uh, California uh, down to Central California getting more precipitation uh, in years ahead. Uh, there, that will occur at certain times of the year. You can store a certain amount of that water, but not all of it, and you're still going to have the dry summer months. And the same models show the, some of the summer months getting drier than they are now. So there's that, that, that summer deficit uh, risk factor plays into this. And also groundwater withdrawals are a high fraction of total withdrawal. Uh, I was speaking with Professor Lund today as a number of students looking at the groundwater challenge and uh, understanding it here in California. And uh, this analysis, uh, like the analysis by Roy et al., it does not get into the details of what's actually available in the aquifers. It's just looking at how much groundwater we're pumping compared to uh, the total withdrawal of water. And if you're pumping a lot of groundwater, you think, gee, the surface water must be limited, and may, are we endangering our groundwater supplies? So there are several uh, large uh, interbasin transfers, of course, uh, here in California, uh, moving water to San Francisco, Los Angeles, and uh, from the, the north to the south. 
and those uh, large IBTs are mitigating some of this risk. The IBTs are not accounted for. The, the, the uh, human-made transfers are not accounted for in this analysis we did. Uh, and uh, to do that, you really need to go transfer by transfer and understand those in more detail. Those are not accounted for in the current risk index, but uh, if uh, we've been thinking a bit about this, and even if you did account for them, uh, we don't think it would, would change that map too much because the demands are so large uh, for agriculture and, uh, and for water supply in Southern California. So this, this modified risk index has uh, changed the, the number of very high risk counties in the analysis uh, quite significantly. We identified a maximum of 36 counties in the U.S. that are high or very high risk and uh, most of those are here in California. Uh, across the country more than 90 percent of the counties had lower neg negligible risk by the scheme that we put together. And uh, most of these IBTs are located near moderate or high risk counties. And uh, they weren't all put in for uh, uh, municipal industrial supply, many of them for agriculture. Uh, but because of the demands that have built up over the years, there's, there's, uh, there's high risk in, in the, many of those locations. So these were our three objectives. Uh, update the inventory, uh, study the drivers of uh, the development of, of interbasin water transfers, and to look at the water, risk, water supply risk in the United States versus demand and think about the role of IBTs uh, to mitigate that risk. There are many different threads you could follow for makeup work, uh, for further uh, follow-on work to this uh, uh, that uh, I don't have time to get into, but there, there's a lot to do here. I hope we've stimulated some thinking for some projects for, for some of you. And uh, to summarize here, the updated inventory, over 2,100 interbasin transfers at the HUC6 scale. Uh, we do not have information about the relative volumes in those transfers, and that's an important piece of follow-on work. Uh, we don't have the databases enable us to do that uh, without a, a readily uh, today. Most of these, uh, the, the major drivers for the construction of these uh, transfers were municipal and industrial supply, agriculture, shipping and navigation, especially in the early years, and drainage and flood management. Florida, it's largely drainage and flood management. Uh, most of them are constructed uh, uh, in, in uh, the hundred years that ended several decades ago. Some people think the age of interbasin transfers is dead. As I said, that's not the case. They're being examined uh, around the country uh, for, and some are under development. And there's some under development in Texas today. Uh, California has the most counties at risk and uh, these IBTs are located usually near moderate and high risk areas. Uh, the uh, this funding was made possible through a, a U.S. Environmental, uh, Environmental Sustainability Fellowship, made possible by a private foundation. And uh, we're very grateful to Sue Joy Roy at uh, Tetra Tech, who's been a uh, consultant on uh, aspects of this. We've moved along uh, to the number of people at the uh, USGS and number of people at U.S. Forest Service who were very, very helpful with the uh, WASI model and enabling us to do what we wanted to do with it. And with that, I will stop and uh, to answer, try to answer any questions you might have or engage in any discussion about any aspect of this you'd like to talk about. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Given the time, a couple questions. Professor Lund. Uh, it, it's uh, unusual these days to see a national level analysis of water supply problems, and water, water management problems. It, it's really not, back in the 1920s, 1930s, through the 19, maybe 1980s, this was not uncommon. Mm. Um, but in the last decades, really since we stopped building big reservoirs and big interbasin transfers, mm -hmm. uh, we've largely stopped. So it's kind of really neat to see this. Um, some of these hot spots that you can identify with this mm -hmm. uh, are, are pretty obvious, and, and many of them are located within a state. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you thought much about what are the implications of this for federal policy versus state policies in, in regulating water and water rights 
water management and environmental management these days? No, we really haven't thought much about the policy implications of that. But I'll tell you, it's very interesting to look at the uh, the state interest in the whole topic. Uh, some states are uh, uh, have a framework in which this is conducted. In other states, it is um, seems to be very lightly attended to. Let me put it that way. So. Uh, I would say uh, from the work that we did, it's, it's clear that there are vast differences among the states in this. And including, um, there were trans many transfers uh, that uh, Karam identified, especially pipeline transfers, and especially in Texas, <laughs> that uh, it was very hard to get information about. And people didn't want to talk about it. And uh, I can't emphasize enough that it was a real slog and talking to many people to try to get information, and, and, and some people were helpful and some people didn't want to talk about it. Uh, so the state differences, I, one takeaway for us was the, the significant differences among states in this. And, and there is public interest in this, but uh, states should be more interested in it. One more question. Professor Young. Given your uh, uh, work on the hydraulic fracturing panel, I wondered if you thought at all about how the water demands of fracking might play into this story. Well, there are, um, there, there are temporary pipelines being developed for moving water to hydraulic fracturing locations. Uh, those are typically temporary because the fracturing just takes place over a relatively short period of time. For hydraulic fracturing, the, the biggest issue is uh, you're aware of, you served on that panel, uh, is moving the, the water that comes up during production, moving that somewhere to do something with. So this is very highly saline water. Uh, in Pennsylvania, it can have uh, dissolved salt levels of 300,000 milligrams per liter or even higher. That's 10 times seawater. And pretty much all you can do with that today uh, economically is inject it deep in the ground. And in Pennsylvania, we only have a few locations where you can do that under permit. So the water is being trucked uh, to Ohio, your home state, uh, <laughs> largely. Uh, and uh, so the, the trucking of produced water uh, is, a, uh, is a really big deal, big problem, yeah. There, are, there is pipeline construction for, uh, for water, but not, not necessarily all of it, because some areas, uh, especially in Texas, there's a very high density of fracking, so there may be more permanent conveyances. More in your water risk index, whether the fracking mattered or... No. Yeah, I don't think it would really show on there. To, to, when those features, uh, the artificial path or the canal ditch, uh, when they're incorporated in the National Hydrography data set, which will be updated periodically, you know, then they'd be captured by this analysis. Okay. One final question. One more. Yeah. Sure, I was actually going to ask about trucking of water as well, not of use water, but of bottled water, um, and the role of that as a de facto basin transfer. I'm not sure how the volumes mm. compare, but especially thinking about targeting the transport of water to mitigate risk, that's what you do with bottled water in a lot of cases, and that's been increasingly the case when you've got climate-related natural disasters that cause localized water stress. Uh, that, um, that kind of analysis uh, would be helpful to understand water moving around, not just bottled water, but you know, embedded water in other products. And there are some people who study that, importation of water in agricultural products or other products. Uh, the water is used in the manufacture of certain kinds of products. Uh, and, and if we were gonna do that kind of analysis, it wouldn't just be bottled water. There's probably more soda that moves around. Uh, and that's all water too. Uh, and when there's a hurricane, for instance, or like a drought, and then people are trucking bottled water there at the pump, they're usually in the Yeah, it's a massive amount of bottles. Uh, it, uh, and, and it, but it's a temporary thing. In the end, it's probably not, not that much water. Uh, but it is a big logistical issue, and it generates a lot of plastic. Uh, and, you know, we think about that. And it is moving water from one basin to another. But uh, there are other kinds of uh, both food products and other kinds of products where water is moving out of basins 
one to another. Uh, and, um, and, and soft drink manufacturers around the world are facing some criticism in pumping up groundwater to make particular soft drink products and the company that makes that is under fire for uh, damaging freshwater resources. Uh, so it's not, uh, bottled water is one aspect of that, but if we're going to focus on water moving around, we'd want to think about other water bearing products. Thank you. And before we thank Dr. Dazombach, I want to make a couple announcements. We have a very lovely reception for everyone outside on the patio so we can continue discussion engagement with Dr. Zumbach. And also, I wanted to present you with a thank you gift from our college oh, to gee, kind of uh, commemorate your lecture here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was very nice of you. Thank you for the invitation. Beautiful. Thank you all so much for coming. Much appreciated. Thank you. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you.